Hi, everybody. My name is Andy Troutman. I'm the uh, software dev manager for AWS Code Deploy. So if you saw Andy's keynote earlier in the week, uh, or sorry, two days ago, a day ago, I'm losing track of time already. Uh, Code Deploy is one of the new app management services that we just announced. It's the first one out of the gate. And today I'm going to talk about Code Deploy as well as Apollo, which is the system uh, internal to Amazon that we use for software deployments. And we're going to kind of compare and contrast the two. And really, when we went and built Code Deploy, we looked a lot at Apollo, our own internal service, because it stood the test of time, and we wanted to see if we could pull some of those lessons learned or best practices out of uh, Apollo and apply them to Code Deploy. So before I go too far, let's provide a little motivation. Uh, as a reminder, uh, software deployment is still a hard problem. <laughs> well, looking at all the people in the room, you probably already realize this. Um, let me walk you through the life cycle of a typical app from the day you start it. So when you start it, uh, it's usually maybe one or two developers working on it. Uh, you're probably targeting a deploy fleet of your desktop or maybe a couple uh, integration or test servers. Um, the cost of failure is extremely low. There's probably not customers using it yet. And so you usually will get by with something like uh, SCP and prodding a couple scripts on your box to get it running. Uh, then success happens, right? So uh, complexity grows. Maybe you hire some more developers. People are actually paying you to do this work now. So you actually have customers that you have to worry about. Uh, and suddenly, SCP doesn't seem as good of an idea. You need some process to coordinate all the people that are now touching the software. And of course, then you achieve stratospheric success. Uh, and you suddenly realize, uh-oh. The, the act of, of coordinating a software change across a big fleet um, is, is risky. Customers are paying us a lot of money now. Uh, it's, it's a lot of coordination both on the team, because there's, in theory, a lot of people using the software, developing on the software. And you really don't want to take downtime. You don't want to have your customers come to your website and see a sign that says, you know, come back later, we're updating our software. Right? That's kind of lame. We don't really want that. Uh, so hopefully that's kind of just a little bit of motivation for where we were coming from. We, uh, Amazon definitely experienced this. We started, uh, started very modestly and, uh, and achieved a lot of success. And so we started to encounter these problems ourselves. Uh, processes that worked on day one didn't work once we got big. So I'm going to take you a little bit back in time. It wasn't that long ago. It was probably a little over a decade at this point, which in I know software terms is, uh, you know, Fossil, fossil records, uh, but when we were working on, uh, on Amazon, uh, we were at a transition point. So just like the previous slide was talking about, we were making the decision uh, to break up what, what, what then was a pretty monolithic app, so a really large application that was kind of developed centrally on a, on a like, focus team uh, into, uh, a, into something that was more manageable. Uh, during the same time, we were kind of having a you know, cultural revolution within the company, too. We were starting to change the way we approached everything. So adopting more agile practices. So we wanted to really decouple teams so they could run a lot faster. They didn't have to wait for another team to, to, to do their work. They could deliver iteratively for the customers, so get things out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, and at the same time that this kind of agile mentality was settling into Amazon's culture, uh, we started to look at how this was going to reflect in the tools that we were building. And the big change for Amazon was we were moving to a service-oriented architecture. So instead of a monolithic application, we were now trying to break it up into services that were uh, well-owned by smaller teams. You know, Amazon's famous two-pizza team. We didn't want teams that were bigger that we could, that we could feed with uh, two pizzas. And so we're trying to decouple everything, make it smaller, make it faster. Uh, and what we realized really quickly was to do that, we were going to have to have tools that accommodated it. So at this time, there wasn't a lot of tooling in place to uh, be able to manage service-oriented architectures, so we had to go build stuff. <laughs> so the tool we built was Apollo. Um, so Apollo is really our case study today. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Apollo has been at Amazon over a decade, uh, faithfully serving us. It is. If you've used uh, Amazon assets, so if you've gone to Amazon.com uh, or anything on AWS, chances are extremely well, extremely good that Apollo put the software on our servers for you to use. Um, so it's used very broadly in the company. 
it's, it's evolved with the company, so you know, it's definitely not the system it was 10 years ago. It's kind of had to keep up with the pace of growth. Um, but in an environment where a lot of tools and services died along the way, where we chose to throw it away when it didn't reach scale, Apollo kind of stuck around. And so it made for a good case study. And, and uh, when we realized that we wanted to offer more options to AWS customers for doing software deployment, uh, we looked back at Apollo and said, what, how did this succeed, right? So like, why, why, why a decade later was it still being used and was still valuable to us? Uh, and so for the rest of this talk, we'll, we'll kind of compare the two. We'll compare Apollo and Code Deploy and try and talk about some of the lessons we pulled forward. Before I go too far, though, I, you should probably understand a little bit of how these systems work. So both systems uh, operate at a high level very similarly. They, uh, there's kind of two workflows that happen both in Code Deploy and Apollo. There's a high level workflow that's really organizing and thinking about uh, fleet level decisions. So to, to define terms, a fleet in this case is a set of instances that we want to run the same version of software. So that could be uh, a test fleet, it could be a development fleet, it could be a production fleet. The top level workflow is thinking about making a software change to one of those stacks. And of course, it al it's also helping you manage multiple stacks because most people don't just write code on their laptop and immediately push it to production without some kind of process. Uh, if you do, good on you, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, the other part that the top level workflow does is it does fleet selection. So when we're doing a deployment, we don't want to deploy the change to every single host in parallel. Uh, that makes the opportunity for failure much greater because I'm going to assume that nobody writes perfect code every single time. And so the, this top level uh, workflow is really picking hosts to, d to put a software change on, performing the deployment, validating that it's uh, healthy. Uh, and then making a decision about what happens next. So if it doesn't come up healthy, it's going to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, if it does come up healthy, it's going to move forward, grab some other collection of instances in your fleet, and start deploying to them. Then there's the uh, lower level workflow. The lower level workflow is really thinking about what's happening on each instance when the deployment is happening on that instance. Right. Uh, probably the best way to illustrate this is with an example. So I'll use one from Code Deploy. Uh, Code Deploy uses a simple config file that we drop inside of our application directory to kind of specify what happens during a software change. So this is a, a really simple example of an app spec file. Uh, there's two sections. There's a file section, which is uh, from a repository to the file system on the instance you want us to uh, put code onto. Uh, that's basically a set of copy commands, right? So, in this case, we're, we're copying from the root of our repository. Uh, in Code Deploy, a repository is either an S3 bucket or a, uh, a GitHub repository. Um, so in this case, we're copying from Slash to you know, var, HTML, million dollar idea. Uh, and then we're going to run through this set of application hooks, right? And so in Code Deploy, we call them lifecycle events. But they're essentially uh, plug-in points for whatever scripts you want us to run that actually accomplishes the, the task of doing a deployment. So deployment is going to be unique and different to every single application. Uh, and so to kind of make it flexible and, and easy to use, what we do here uh, is just give you plug-in points. Right? So in this case, uh, we, we, we stop the server. Uh, we install any dependencies or validate that our dependencies are there. Then we start back up the server. We start a logging process that, that is deployed along with our million dollar idea. Uh, and then we run a ping test to make sure the application actually came up uh, healthy. Uh, so both Apollo does this slightly different. Apollo uses a file system-based convention. And I'll talk about that a little bit later and some of the decisions that led us to a file instead of a, a folder hierarchy. But at a really high level, this is, these two systems, this is how they accomplish their work. They have a top-level workflow that's marching through the fleet. And then they have a workflow that's actually doing work on each instance. So now let's jump into lessons. So what is it, when we, when we look back, what could we pull away from Apollo? Uh, the first lesson that jumped, I think, to everyone's mind was flexibility. This picture kind of illustrates Amazon's culture. We're not the big homogenous block in the back. When you look at our tech culture, it's very much so comprised of a lot of individual pieces. Uh, Amazon really values uh, ownership. We uh, value letting our engineers make the technical decisions, and that goes down to the technology that they use. Uh, the way they measure their success, all, all of it. And so Amazon has grown up to be a culture that has a very broad set of technology in play at any given time. 
we are not just a Java shop. We, uh, you'll see all code from all places. And so if we're gonna have a deployment system that's gonna support that, it needs to be extremely flexible. It needs to be application agnostic in the way uh, it interacts with your code when it's doing a deployment. Uh, AWS is the same way, so that culture kind of carried forward. We're trying to be the cloud platform for everybody. We're not the cloud platform if you are just a Java developer. We're not the cloud platform if you're just a .NET developer, PHP or Python, right? We want everyone to come and feel like they can get a lot of value out of the platform. So Code Deploy kind of had this same impetus. It really needed to be flexible. Uh, let me show you a quick demo, maybe. <laughs> so I'm gonna do the dangerous thing and, and uh, try and do live demos while uh, on the stage here. Um, so let me bring up a, an EC2 instance. In this demo, what I'm gonna do is uh, show, you, show a, a deployment with Code Deploy. Um, and it, we were trying to think, how do we actually show flexibility when I really only have time to do a single demo? So I mixed together a bunch of technologies to just show that we work with a bunch of things. In this example, I'm going to do a deployment where uh, I deploy to instances using Code Deploy, and it's gonna control that top level workflow. Uh, and then I'm gonna use Chef Solo to actually do the lower level workflow installation. Uh, and I'm gonna install a Tomcat app, uh, which just is gonna run a little servlet, and we'll get a, a really simple web page, an embarrassingly simple web page. So what I've done here is I've CD'd in a directory. Uh, I'll show you what's in this directory because it's somewhat interesting. We have the app spec file, which I was just talking about. That's basically the configuration that tells us how to perform the deployment on a single instance. We have a copy of Chef. Uh, we have the, the source code for the thing that we're actually building. I've done the Martha Stewart trick. I've pre-baked some things, so I've already run uh, Maven package on this so that everything's ready to go. Uh, let me show you the app spec just so you can get a sense for what's happening. So very simple app spec. Uh, Files at the top, we're basically copying chef to Etsy chef code deploy. We're copying our war file uh, to var lib tomcat. Then we're gonna run through this little life cycle. So first we're going to uh, install chef. We're gonna instantiate our chef solo run that's gonna configure tomcat and move our servlet to the right place. Then we have a little verify script that's gonna call the servlet and make sure that we actually get back some piece of HTML that looks like what we wanted. So just a, a really quick, simple demo. Uh, so let me, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is push the application. So uh, I wrote a little helper script just to, so I didn't have to, you guys didn't have to watch me type every single line here. But uh, what I did was using the AWS CLI, uh, you can download it or update it and get the latest stuff for code deploy. We uh, pushed an application, the application is called Chef Demo. We uploaded it to S3 in this case and we told it to just ignore hidden files in the directory so don't bring all our dot files along. Uh, once it uploads it, so it happened really fast because this is a pretty small, simple application, it'll, it'll immediately spit out the next command to run to deploy the application. So I'm gonna take advantage of that. I'm just gonna copy it. Uh, in here, you can see things like the, the E tag for the bucket that we uploaded. So I'm using a version bucket, so it'll uh, keep track of that stuff. Um, boop. The only thing I need to add is the uh, deployment group name. So a deployment group is logically equivalent to a fleet. Uh, it's the name we use in code deploy. It can be a, a set of EC2 instances that have been tagged in some way that's meaningful to you, or you can use an auto-scaling group name. Uh, so let me see, I have uh, chef demo. Yeah. I chose a very long name, and I'm gonna hope that that was the right name, it was. Okay, so I've kicked off a deployment. It gives me back a deployment ID. Uh, from the command line, I could, I could uh, manually write a puller or uh, use the waiters inside of um, the command line tool to get status right from the command line. Um, I'm gonna go look at the console because it's a little bit prettier. Uh, so this, this is the code deploy console. If I go over to deployments, we should see a deployment that's in progress. Um, so I'm deploying to 18 instances and I believe I set this one up to deploy in parallel. So it's, kinda go, it's gonna go from blue to green really quickly. <laughs> well, not really quickly. It'll deploy to all the 18 instances in parallel. Um, don't don't uh, tell anyone I told you to deploy to all your instances in parallel, but a lot to, a lot to talk about, so I'm gonna do it that way. Uh, if I want, I can, I can dig into the actual deployment a little bit further and get other information about what's happening. Uh, so while it's deploying, I can actually see hosts that are being deployed to. Um, so boop, boop, boop. So I broke some of my instances, but uh, eight of them succeeded. Looks like it's still in progress. 
Um, cool. So I, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I'll come back to this and prove that it actually finished the deployment, but uh, I, this, this talk is long, so <laughs> I'm going to carry on. So this is a, oh, let me hit the magical button. Uh, we're back. So this is an example of doing a deployment using uh, Tomcat, Chef, uh, and code deploy together. Um, we could easily swap out Chef for another uh, configuration management service like Puppet. Um, and we can also, of course, change the application. Since code deploy is pretty app agnostic, it's just deploying, uh, it's just copying files and running scripts on your behalf. It kind of is pretty flexible and easy to use with a bunch of stuff. So lesson one, be flexible. Make it easy to let the uh, people deploying code pick the right uh, technology. Lesson tools, uh, uh, bleh. lesson two, tools must be safe, uh, but not restrictive. So this is a picture of people building their own fireworks and then shooting them at each other. That's not safe, so. <laughs> uh, um, so don't do that. Uh, again, d d don't, uh, you know, don't, go t don't tell your parents that I told you to shoot fireworks at each other. Uh, so th I think there's a natural tension between um, putting in guardrails that make the right thing happen when mistakes happen and putting in so many guardrails that you're uh, unable to kind of use the tool in a flexible way. So again, when we look back at Apollo, we felt like it hit a sweet spot. Uh, so really early, we realized that we were in the business of being able to deploy software uh, and deploy bad software and have it not affect our customer, right? That ended up being Apollo's goal, was to let customers deploy what they want, but to try really hard to make sure that any mistakes they made along the way wouldn't show up to our actual end users. Uh, the way Apollo approached this was to do rolling deployments. So a rolling deployment is essentially, uh, we take advantage of the fact that there's usually redundant capacity uh, in an environment. So uh, most people don't run a single app server, they run a couple so that when something breaks, you have a backup and uh, kind of grasp, gracefully does the right thing. So we realized we could take advantage of that extra capacity during a deployment. Uh, and we could pull out some capacity, upgrade it, put it back in service and kind of head down the fleet that way. The piece of configuration we came up with uh, for Apollo and for code deploy was what we call minimum healthy hosts. Uh, so this is how you tell the, the system how aggressive it can be during a software change. So uh, the contract is, is, is pretty simple. You tell us the minimum number of hosts you have to have available at any time uh, to serve your customer. So in this case, I'm saying I have to have at least two instances out of my three available no matter what's going on. Uh, then that top level workflow that we talked about earlier is gonna work within those constraints, right? So it's gonna look at the host that it has available and come up with some kind of strategy for deploying. So in this case, uh, just to go through this example really quickly, we have three instances. They are fronted by an auto scaling group and a load balancer. Since you told us I have to keep two up at all times, um, I'm gonna take one out because that's all I can afford to take out to keep my promise to you. Upgrade it to version two. In this case, the happy thing happens and version two comes up successful go to the next instance, unbind it so it's not uh, receiving customer traffic, update it again. Uh, in the happy case, everything worked out well and we're on version two of the application. Uh, but we all know that's not what always happens, right? So, <laughs> uh, so let's look at an example where it actually fails because I think it's probably a more interesting case when we talk about safety. So let's assume that version three actually fails the deployment. Uh, if version three uh, fails the deployment, um, the system will do something that's kind of subtle but smart. It will, it will realize that it can't keep its promise to us anymore. We said we have to keep two up at all times. It can't take out any more capacity, so it's gonna stop the deployment, right? Uh, once it stops, uh, a human needs to get involved to make a decision, so you can either uh, roll forward with uh, a patch for this problem, or most people would probably roll back, get the system stable, and then think about you know, how to actually come up with a way to fix the problem. So we're gonna look at a rollback. Uh, again, the system does something subtle, but I think kind of smart. Uh, if there had been multiple instances that had failed, we would have deployed to all of them at the same time, right? Because we're already under the assumption that the thing that you didn't want to have happen did happen, so the application broke in some way. Uh, so uh, could deploy tries to aggressively get the system back to a healthy state as quickly as possible. So it's gonna pick all the instances that are broken, deploy to them. In this case, since we're rolling back, it succeeds. Uh, and then we're back to a healthy state. So that's kind of an example of a rolling deployment. Let's do another uh, demo and I'll show you another aspect of this, hopefully. Um, back. So let me bring up these instances. 
So I managed to uh, succeed this because I, um, so I failed half of my instances, I'm not sure why. Of course, when you do a demo, you're never sure why things fail. <laughs> uh, so let me do another demo. Hopefully this one will go a little smoother. Um, I'm gonna go back to my applications page. I'm gonna select my rollout demo. Uh, so I'll show you a rolling deployment uh, to an 18 instance fleet. So what I have here on the left-hand side uh, is our deployment group. So like we talked about earlier, deployment group is logically a fleet. We wanna put the same version of software on it. Uh, so for this application, uh, I put together this silly little page that's gonna show you uh, the instances in real time as I'm updating them, and we can kind of watch the deployment happen, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so let me deploy a new revision to this group. Um, I'm gonna, again, use S3. I'm gonna select V2 of my application. It uh, auto-detects that it's a version. I can say, hello, Vegas. Uh, and then I'm gonna, so like we were talking about with deployment config, I'm actually gonna select a third at a time for this application. So rather than doing it uh, one at a time, which would be the most cautious thing, or 50% at a time, which would be somewhere in the middle. Uh, you can also do it all at once. You can you know, cowboy up and go for it. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm gonna do a third at a time. Uh, I'm gonna kick off this deployment, uh, hopefully. So it's created. So we should, in theory, be able to go back to this view, and uh, as the deployment's happening, hopefully we'll see some instances go green uh, on version two. Uh, there you go. So, so you notice, like, as it was deploying, you, uh, you saw the instances, um, pop in all three availability zones. So what I have here is three AZs. AZs are uh, a way for us to kind of isolate our application in the same geographic region. So th the goal is to keep uh, availability zones for the most part network isolated and, and available as much as possible. So failure in one AZ is unlikely, but possible. A failure in multiple AZs should be extremely unlikely. So the system, again, is doing something pretty subtle for us. Uh, it's trying to put our deployment, deployment across the ACs. It's striping it. The reason we want to do that is because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket in the case of a failure, right? So if I uh, deployed everything to uh, availability zone one in this, in this demo uh, and, and availability, ugh, availability zone two uh, lost connectivity and <laughs> my deployment uh, was a bad deployment, we're down to only availability zone three uh, serving our customers, which is likely not what we wanted. It would be much better if we distributed it uh, evenly across the AZ so that if we lose connectivity during a deployment, we're actually losing less overall available servers to, to help customers out. So there's another thing that the service kind of does to, to preserve as best as possible availability for your customers, your end users. Okay, so that's, that's that demo. Let me switch back. Next lesson, uh, helping the humans out. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we realized in Apollo um, that auto you know, automatic remediation is the best. So if the system can self-heal or drive, drive around problems, that's exactly what we want it to do. Uh, but the reality is that sometimes things are gonna break and a human is gonna have to get involved and uh, make a decision. Um, so in those cases, we want to help them make the, the quickest and best decision possible. In Apollo, what we did uh, for our, the first deployment visualization page we ever built, we displayed everything. <laughs> and I mean everything. Every instance, every lifecycle event, uh, real time. Um, this worked great when you were deploying to three instances, when we were deploying to fleets of thousands. The visualization kind of broke down and got a little busy. It was really hard to figure out what was going on, uh, especially when something was breaking, uh, because that's really when you're looking at the deployment page. Uh, once you build confidence, you probably aren't watching every single deployment go out in real time. So let me show you a demo uh, again. Or this isn't really a demo. I'm just gonna walk through the console. Uh, okay. Oh, so that's that deployment finished up. Um, so let me go back to my deployments list. So in, uh, in Code Deploy and in Apollo, we, we had to iterate on that view, right? Because it just got insanely busy. It wasn't helping humans at all. <laughs> So let me take a look at a failed deployment to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. So I have this example website deployment that you can see I deployed earlier and it failed. So at the highest level, uh, we give you just a very high level view of what's happened on the instance. We can see that one instance failed and then we skipped 18. Uh, we skipped 18 because I did a single host deployment. So did the most cautious deployment possible. 
as soon as one instance failed, we bailed, right? So what you see here is just a very quick, like, status bar view of the world. Um, that's potentially interesting, but if you're trying to actually diagnose what's happening, you'll want Im more information. So we can actually drill down a little bit further into the, into the deployment. Uh, and we can actually get now kind of uh, instance level status of what happened during that deployment. So in this case, we're getting a list of all the instances that were participating. Excuse me. Uh, most of them are skipped. Uh, but we do have this one failed one. So we get a little bit more information here. We can see when the deployment started, how long it took for the deployment to run. We can also see what lifecycle event it failed on. Still not enough information, you say. Uh, let's, let's go down to the event level information. So now we've transitioned from that uh, top level workflow that's making fleet level decisions to the lower level workflow uh, that's, that's showing you what actually happened on the box. So here now we can see like what, uh, what step in the deployment we were actually running when bad things happened. So everything was going along well. We did the application stop. We downloaded the new software. We installed it. Uh, and then when we tried to validate, things went bad, right? So at this point, that might be enough information to act on. If you were deploying a new validation script, you might just say, okay, well, I need to go back to the drawing board. If you want to go further, we can go down to the logs, which most people will want to, right? So eventually, you want to drill down all the way to the logs. And again, we want to help humans out. We don't want you to have to uh, get out your keys and try and SSH onto a random instance to figure out where the problem is. So what we do is, if, it, if any instance fails its deployment, we'll pipe back the last 2K of your log file. So we'll, we'll tell the last 2K, make it immediately available in the console so you can kind of figure out real quickly uh, telemetry for where the problem was. In this case, it's, it's puked a bunch of uh, JavaScript stack, stack trace to me. Um, I'm not going to debug it here. You probably, probably don't want me to do that. <laughs> uh, so there's an example of kind of helping the humans out, where w what we really wanted to do was we wanted to encourage the system uh, to, to give us a high-level overview and let us drill down into the thing we cared about, um, rather than kind of giving us all the information that we could possibly want and forcing us to kind of sift through it manually. Uh, a related, a parallel, uh, a corollary, if you will, to uh, helping the humans out is to be explicit. So um, part of, sometimes you can present information in such a way that it's not actionable. <laughs> and we definitely saw cases of this uh, as we were kind of iterating on Apollo and making it better and better. Sometimes we would end up in a place where we didn't really know what the right thing was. So let me talk about that one. Um, remember earlier I talked about app spec files and I said Apollo had a slightly different convention. So the way Apollo um, lets you specify what scripts to run during a particular uh, lifecycle event is it had a folder-based convention. So we would have folders that were named with particular lifecycle events. You would just drag the files that you wanted to run in the folder. Really easy to configure. You just drag your files in. Uh, and then we would run them sort of ascibetically. Uh, so we'd uh, run them in, in some order that uh, you specified. So this was a great idea, and it worked pretty well. Uh, the, the problem came when we allowed customers to combine multiple applications into a single deployment. So now we would dump a collection of the scripts to run, uh, and the names would collide, right? So <laughs> two people would either want to name their stuff the same way. And so then it became a war of trying to get your stuff to run first during the deployment. And so people came up with these uh, kind of silly names. You, know, you would prefix it with a bunch of zeros and a one to try and get your thing to go first, 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 first. Um, that made it really hard. So when you glance at a list of these, it's really hard to kind of tell what's happening or what's changing. So this is actually two versions. The top box is version one of this app deployment, and the bottom box is the second version. If you glance at it, you can figure it out, but it takes a little bit of mental uh, uh, diffing in your mind to kind of figure out which version has changed. You can see here uh, this last file changed from v2 to v3, and some other thing changed, 14. So uh, we went from 15 to 14. Um, this was made a little bit more difficult because since it's a file system, we overwrote it every time we did a deployment. <laughs> so uh, if you did a deployment and something broke and you went to the file system to see what changed between version one and version two, you didn't have that information available. We had overwritten it with the new files. So uh, we wanted to do better, right? So we wanted to do better in code deploy, and we ended up with an app spec, which I've shown a couple times now, so you guys are old hats at app specs. So here's a diff of version one and version two of an app spec. Um, I've color-coded it to cheat and make my point, but hopefully it's pretty obvious what's changed between the two versions, right? So between version one and version two, at a glance, I can really quickly see uh, that um, the start server has changed from version one to version two, and I've added a new validation script. 
So because an app spec is just a, a configuration file, we would totally encourage all of our customers to check it in with your application that you're deploying and version control it, right? Get that history over time. We found it's been very valuable to be able to go back in time and look at an app spec and say, what actually changed between here and here, right? Um, it's a really quick like sanity check for did something did someone change something that was important, right? Did we uh, remove a script that was valuable to our deployment or add something new that's likely the candidate for failure? Uh, and if you if you version control this file, you get that kind of really quickly. You don't have to go to the instance and figure something out. So this is a, an example of being explicit. Lesson five. Uh, works well with others. This guy's definitely working well with others. Uh, <laughs> so one thing we realized about Apollo, uh, in the beginning, our customers used Apollo directly a lot. So they would go to the Apollo website, in our case, the Code Deploy console, uh, and they would do all their work there. Uh, and then the company kept growing. We kept adding more and more tooling. We added you know, build services, test services, continuous integration, uh, you know, the whole nine yards. So we're building more and more tools around Apollo. Um, the engineers in Apollo made a really smart decision, which was that they didn't try and force people to go to their application to do their work, right? So Apollo uh, really gracefully slotted into that lower level uh, building block piece. Uh, and, and today, most people accomplish deployments in Apollo and never go to the web page, right? Because they're kicked off by other systems. They go to their continuous integration environment, uh, their code pipeline, and, they, they, uh, and Apollo is just triggered as a, as a matter of course, right? And so um, we felt like that was a really key advantage to keeping Apollo relevant for, for our internal customers. Uh, same way with Code Deploy. We wanted to build a lower level building block that kind of did one thing and focused on it. We wanted to focus on getting your bits from your repo onto the box and, and running some code for you, right? And so uh, you know, we expect some customers will use Code Deploy directly. We expect a lot of customers will do that. But we really wanted to make sure that you could use it with just about anything you wanted to use it with. Uh, so these are some of our integration partners. We worked really hard to try and get a bunch of people on board uh, with Code Deploy from the beginning. Um, here's, a, here's a sample of them. Um, GitHub is a good example. So we have GitHub as a, as a repository type. Something that you can do with GitHub that you can't do um, through an S3 repository is you can configure GitHub so that every time you check in, it immediately kicks off a deployment. So you can just get that automation for free. Uh, so that's a case where uh, the experience is richer when we integrated with a partner. Um, let, me let me do another demo. I'll show you one other integration that we did. Boop. Uh, so our old friend Jenkins. Uh, I'm going to assume people in this room have heard of Jenkins. But if you haven't, it's a continuous integration open source system. A lot of people use it uh, to kind of automate a release process. So when, when code gets checked in, you can make Jenkins uh, pull it down, build it, run tests for you and kind of march it through uh, a release process. Uh, so we know a lot of people use Jenkins. It's a very popular tool. Uh, so we wrote a plugin for code deploys so that you could use code deploy with Jenkins and not have to work too hard at it. So uh, you'll remember at the beginning of the talk, I did uh, a quick demo of um, code deploy from the command line where I uh, kicked off a deployment uh, using Chef and deployed a, a Tomcat app. So I'll do that same thing uh, from, from Jenkins. Uh, so the nice thing, so I, uh, just as a quick aside, it had been a while since I'd used Jenkins, uh, and I came back to it, and everything was right where I wanted it to be. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll just kick off a new build. Build is scheduled. We should see it pop up down here. Um, so I can go to the build, um, and I, I actually am getting my console output directly from the build. So at the top, you can see I actually pull down a revision from Git. I call Maven package on it. Uh, the build succeeds, and then down here, I'm actually watching the deployment happen, maybe? Or did I break my deployment? Um, this is what happens when you build on top of your, your application. So you, uh, oh, okay, so it actually, it did, it did start the deployment. So we could sit here and, uh, there you go, so now it's getting some status. Uh, if you pull the service too quickly uh, and it doesn't have any status for you, it tells you it doesn't have any status. Um, I'm not going to make you guys sit through the pain of watching this command line update, but rest assured, if you wanted to, you could sit here and watch. Uh, it'll, it'll just continue to pull the service, and you'll watch the update happen. So there's an example of one of our uh, integrations um, with Jenkins. I haven't noted it yet, but all of, the, all of the examples I've done today, as well as quite a few more, are available on AWS Labs. So you can go 
down to AWS Labs and download all these examples and try them out yourself, start playing with them. Uh, so let me go back. Cool. So those are the lessons I had. Um, so l let's go over them again. Uh, when we looked back at Apollo, what we really realized is um, a lot of the lessons are, are the things that you would, you would write down on a list of desirable features for any tool that you build, right? So you want your tools to be flexible. You want them to be safe, but uh, not too safe. Uh, they should help the users make the right decisions. They should provide clarity when you're using them. Uh, and they should work with what you already have, because no one wants to pick up their whole process and move it somewhere else. Uh, and so that's, that's really the lessons we kind of took away from Apollo. Uh, it's one of those things where when you write down the list, it seems self-evident, and then when you try and execute on it, it can be very difficult. So uh, that's why we wanted to look at something that actually succeeded in the past. Um, just a quick plug for code deploy. Uh, if you want to try it out, you can do your first deployment from the management console. You can click through a wizard, and it'll spin up EC2 capacity and do your first deployment. Uh, download the CLI, and you can start uh, downloading the sample app. Um, and like I just mentioned, you can check out AWS Labs if you want to try any of the samples. Attribution for the art. So uh, I, I stole all this art from other people. Please give them props. <laughs> Uh, that's all the, I had today. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I believe we're going to take questions out in the hall. Actually, I have a couple minutes. So uh, as is happens every time you do a, a talk, uh, I'll th I can take questions for eight minutes up here if we want. Um, thank you. Cool. I'm sorry. No. Uh, so, so the question was, does uh, code deploy spin up an EC2 instance for you? The answer is no. Uh, back to that point where we wanted to keep it as a building block service that really did one thing. We focused it on code deployment. A lot of our customers have integrated it with CloudFormation. If you're an auto-scaling customer, you can set up hooks that will automatically perform a deployment when a new instance is scaled up. And we'll even make sure that uh, the instance doesn't enter service until the deployment succeeds. So if we fail the deployment, auto-scaling won't put the instance in service. It'll go f get a fresh instance and try again. Uh, Jenkins, we actually wrote a plugin for, so it's calling the service directly. Uh, sure. Uh, during a deployment. Um, so we do have some sample scripts that you can drop into your uh, app spec, which will will unbind and bind back to the load balancer as part of the deployment. And if we can't, if we can't get a hold of ELB, we will fail the deployment. Um, but uh, is that what you're asking, or is it? Okay. Today, today you get that that uh, functionality through auto scaling. We're definitely looking uh, at other options to kind of carry that forward. Uh, but today, no. Uh, I'm sorry, can you speak a little louder? Good question. So the answer was, how do we deal with common resources like a database update uh, between the fleet? Today, we don't have a great answer. We're really focused on the, the life cycle that's happening on the, on the, um, on the actual fleet. We've talked about extending that concept of lifecycle events to have kind of global pre and post hooks. So that you can plug it into like a broader process that's happening across the fleet. But uh, you know, we're kind of looking for customer feedback. So if it's something you're interested in, we'd love to hear it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because our system, sorry, the question was, uh, do we have to include any scripts for rollback? Uh, Yes, so by default, the system will unstage any files that we know about. So if you put the files in your app spec, uh, we will, we'll keep track of what files were actually on the instance between versions. And so if you roll back to a previous version, we'll remove files that weren't there to make the file system look like it did during that deployment. Uh, but, but if your scripts have side effects, so if you run scripts and they do something else, we don't have any way of knowing about that, so you need to take that into account with your scripts. That's correct. So the two repositories that we integrate with today are S3 and GitHub. Are you guys planning on extending that? We love hearing from our customers. So <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, come talk to me if you guys, you know, if you have a laundry list of the repositories you want to be able to pull code from. We're, we're always looking for what's next. Is it a fully fledged model which requires a different legacy, or are you doing fully environment? 
Right, so the question was, are, is it a push-based deploy where uh, we need SSH keys to log into the instance, or is it a pool-based model where we're running an agent? It's the latter, so it's a pool-based model. Our agent, uh, the off primitive that we deal with is, um, is an EC2 IAM role. Um, so, so basically, if you're, it, it can be any role. We don't need any special permissions. It's just how we establish the trust relationship between us and your instances. Sorry, which service? I still didn't hear you, sorry. Oh, uh, um, definitely being planned. We don't have any integration yet. <laughs> but it's not out yet, as far as I know. So <laughs> we still got time. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, I don't think we're solving that. Pro sorry, so the question was, what, what is our strategy provi for provisioning secret keys and getting them to the instance? Uh, today, we don't have a great story. With the new key management services just released, we're looking uh, to see if we can use that to kind of get secrets onto the box that you can use. But today, um, n n the service isn't really solving that problem. Uh, if you want to get secret keys onto the box. Uh, sorry, uh, our secrets or your secrets? Um, today, you can, uh, if you want, you can uh, deploy them encrypted in the bundle that we actually download uh, and decrypt them on the box, uh, or you can, you know, bootstrap them another way. Good question. So the question was, are, are we planning on integrating this with Elastic Beanstalk? Integrating with the higher level app management services like Beanstalk and Opsworks is definitely on our roadmap. We want to make sure that if you're an existing Beanstalk or Opsworks customer, uh, you, can, you, know, you can use code deploy under the hood to kind of accomplish your job. But it's not there yet. We're still kind of working with both those teams to figure out when we can get it in place. The question was, how do you keep track of what's kind of happening end to end between uh, you know, developer environment, test environment, production? Uh, code pipelines is going to be the thing that solves that in a more realistic way. Today, you can set up separate uh, um, de deployment configs or deployment groups. And, and I, I believe on one of the slides you saw, you'll get a list of the deployment groups as well as the last deployment that happened to them and its outcome. And you can drill down to a particular deployment group to see all the deployments that happened there. Uh, but code pipelines will really be when we can model that process in a much more visual way. So you can actually go, go to a console and see like in real time where changes are, where they're flowing to, uh, and sort of like that, that kind of data that's really holistically where changes are happening. Correct, yes. Right, yeah, the question was, uh, can you see a version uh, travel across the fleet with code pipelines? Yes. Uh, code pipelines will keep track of kind of all the changes that are happening. You can get that view kind of across everything. Sure. Well, uh, the question was, will it will it integrate with your QA process? So, will uh, you know if, if you if you're using Sauce Labs or something else to run tests, can it uh, honor the outcome of that test to kick off a deployment or not? We're definitely looking for more integration like that. T today we have a few, but um, we'll we'll be kind of investing more and more where we hear customer needs. Sure. So the question was for a more complicated rollback scenario, like if you were deploying a, a really complex directory structure with Tomcat, uh, what will we keep track of? Uh, we, we, we'll just keep track of the things that you tell us about in the app spec file. So we will look at folders and we'll look at what's in those folders. Um, so the contract we have is essentially we'll make the, uh, the file system look like it did when we copied from your application directory onto the instance. Uh, but anything else, uh, it's going to be up to the, the owner of the application to kind of write logic to uh, unstaged changes. Uh, so the question was, is there a rollback phase in a, in a deployment? Uh, there's not an explicit rollback phase. In, in our system, rollback is essentially a roll forward with a, an existing 
or with a previous version. So we, we basically will just run through the whole life cycle again. Um, oh, that was perfectly timed. I hit time. So I'm happy to answer more questions in the hall. Thank you all for coming out. Thank <laughs> you.